Um, so thank you very much indeed for that very kind introduction. Um, it's a great honour to have been invited to participate in this series. And indeed, I, I'm uh, slightly overwhelmed by the, the eminent uh, audience that I have um, before me, albeit virtually. Um, so um, I hope this afternoon's talk um, will be a, a small contribution to the extraordinary uh, conversations that have been going on as part of this, this seminar series. Uh, you will have heard that I'm a, a museum curator by profession, and indeed the talk that I'm going to give you really emerged out of plans um, for an exhibition around the origins of ancient Egyptian kingship, particularly in the context of its connections, Egypt's connections with the wider world, and not least that of Iran. Um, sadly, the exhibition uh, couldn't progress, uh, a problem of loans and then um, certainly the pandemic. Um, but I hope that some of the thoughts that I'll share with you today will be of interest. So when thinking about the potential of the Iranian plateau as a source of imagery for the late Chalcolithic and early Bronze Age, it is very important that we bear in mind just how fragmentary our evidence is. Recent excavations, as well as a reanalysis of older evidence, however, has begun to provide a few insights into how imagery played a role in defining the, the identities of societies of Iran, as well as how they serve to navigate the differences with people of the wider region. This has been facilitated over the last couple of decades by a shift in scholarship more generally, away from an emphasis on the lowlands of Mesopotamia as the source of all cultural developments. Indeed, given Iran's rich resources in stones, metals and wood, it should come as no surprise, and it certainly won't to anybody in this audience, peoples of the highlands were important agents in a range of socio-economic, political and cultural processes throughout the prehistoric and historic periods. Indeed, this has become very clear in, uh, in the number of talks already given as part of the, this series. There has been and always was a close relationship between the lowlands of Mesopotamia and the highlands of Iran, uh, particularly from the late fifth through the third millennium BC. And this has long been acknowledged. Here, I must pay tribute to the work of Pierre Amier, who very sadly has recently passed away. It was his reviews of Iran's material culture um, which articulated what has been described as a Bronze Age of exchange. It is his work that I will certainly be drawing upon in this talk, but it is especially on the work more recently of Professor Holly Pitton, who has been leading the way in showing how visual imagery, especially through sealing practices, reflects a close, complex and dynamic relationship between Iran and the wider region and in all directions. My focus today will be on representations of composite creatures, those that combine animal and human physical traits and connections from Iran with the West. For glyptic experts and indeed art historians um, of the ancient world, much of this will be very familiar territory. But I hope what over the next minute, few minutes, I will provide a useful summary overview of an artistic convention which allows us to widen the discussion beyond the Mesopotamia-Iran binary and also consider the active agency of Iran in its formulation. Well, the period from the late fifth to the third millennium comes with considerable chronological difficulties and establishing contemporaneity between the regions remains very problematic. The published Uruk period sequence is unreliable and it is not representative. Um, and the existence, as pointed out in articles, for example, by Jakob Dale and Cameron Petrie, Dan Potts, the existence of a large plateau in the radiocarbon calibration curve that spans the critical period of 3400 to 2900 BC adds considerably to this uncertainty. 
There may, for example, be significant overlaps between Sousa Acropole 1 levels, 16 to 11, and the later Rook and even early Dynastic 1 periods. The date ranges in this table that you see here, and some, therefore, of the connections and relationships that I will describe are therefore very much open to challenge. I want to begin, however, late in the story in Babylonia, um, the alluvial plains of southern Iraq, of course, during the later third millennium BC, since it is that imagery, um, the imagery of that period, which has been the focus of much discussion and interpretation, and is often understood as the source for imagery found in the highlands. Then I will look back several millennia to consider some of its roots. Well, for the people of Babylonia, reality and myth came together at their eastern horizon, marked dramatically by the Zagros Mountains. Here, according to Franz Wigerman, lay a shadow side, populated by monstrous and fabulous beings. A little more recently, Christopher Woods has described the, this horizon as a liminal land, I quote, seemingly approachable but ever distant. It is the great divide between day and night, between what is known and what is unknown. An iconography of fantastic, often composite creatures were used, used in Mesopotamia to describe this Eastern world. And this was made evident through sculpture dedicated in temples and more generally through imagery carved on cylinder seals. And key to this relationship between um, the mountains and the lowlands was the sun. From southern Mesopotamia, the sun rises over the central Zagros at the summer solstice and then migrates south, moving until it rises over the Persian Gulf at the winter solstice. In one of the most recognizable scenes from the glyptic of the Sargonic period, so the late third millennium BC, guardians swing open the gates of heaven, shown in this particular seal or its impression as two rectangular door leaves. And then the sun god, Utu in Sumerian, Shamash in Akkadian, rises between the two peaks of the mountain, brandishing his distinct, distinctive Shasharu saw. In other seals, these, the two mountain peaks are replaced by two recumbent bison. These are the Kusariku, human-faced bison, a symbolic representation of the bison that were once indigenous to the flanks of the Zagros. Other images include a large horn atop a mountain. You can see in the center of the impression, the top of the slide. This is likely representative of a Persian ibex with its majestic recurved horns, an animal that remains a native to the slopes of the Zagros. And finally, flora also play a part in this iconography, a particular conical tree, a conifer of some type, um, sometimes with three offshoots, which is likely to be connected with the Hashua tree mentioned in Mesopotamian texts. Aspects of this imagery are very late expressions of very ancient conventions, which can be traced back to at least the fifth millennium BC, a time when there was an expansion in the acquisition, production and exchange of materials across Western Iran and Mesopotamia. And this is reflected in the changing designs engraved on small stone seals, stamp seals. By the later fifth millennium, such seals were being used within systems which monitored the production, movement and distribution of raw materials, foodstuffs and finished goods. The engraved images used to convey information expanded from geometric patterns to include figural imagery that included representations of not only horned animals, but also humans. Of particular interest here is the appearance of a much discussed humanoid figure with the head of an animal, sometimes with curved horns like those of the caprids that accompany it on some of the seals. These caprids 
are probably intended to be Persian ibexes. And given that the female ibex has short horns, the long horns worn by the figures suggest that we are looking at a male. Some seals associate him with one or more snakes. And a few examples here um, from a, a, an early article by Richard Barnett discussing this intriguing figure. The image is known from seals and impressions within the foothills and mountains, reaching from Digirim Tepe in eastern Anatolia to Tal Brak in Syria. And you see an image there from uh, relatively recent excavations um, at Tal Brak, dating to the late uh, fifth millennium. Uh, Tepe Gaura in North Mesopotamia, and then places like Tepe Giyan in the central Zagros to Susa in the Khuzestan lowlands. There is thus not only a sharing of administrative technology along the length of the Zagros for branding and marking ownership of goods, but also of symbolism as expressed in the imagery of the seals. Seal impressions from Susa, which come from Acropole 1 level 25, as well as some unstratified examples, these are the most elaborate representations of this figure, and indeed maybe a local variant of him. He wears an ankle length skirt, sometimes with zigzag patterning, and he is shown either lifting a vessel while standing alongside humans, perhaps suggesting ritual activity, or grasping snakes and lions in raised outstretched hands. Some of these figures wear horns, whereas others wear different forms of headdress. A version of this individual may be identified in the imagery painted on contemporary ceramics from the Acropole Cemetery at Susa. Here, magnificent male ibexes, as well as snakes, dogs, and birds are shown on very tall beakers. Anthropomorphic figures are very rarely depicted on um, these vessels, but one open bowl has a figure with outstretched arms and a highly geometrical body, similar to some of the figures that appear on stamp seals, and you can see it at the top of the slide on the bowl. He is associated with highly stylized animals and so-called comb animals at the center, shown on the right and the left um, of the bowl, um, probably represent woolly sheep. There are also three birds, possibly vultures, and a scorpion. Uh, and this interpretation is based on the combination of these animals, no, also known from stamp seals of a similar date. Now the humanoid figure, stands between two pedestals surmounted by staffs with triangular heads. Uh, they, they are framed by a geometric design formed by three parallel lines. Now, past interpretations have suggested that these parallel lines are irrigation canals, while the staffs have been associated with spades for working the land. The same motifs, but without the humanoid figure, appear on the opposite side of the bowl, so at the bottom of the screen. The pedestals, however, may be better understood as representing mountains surmounted by conical trees, as is certainly known from later imagery, in which we will see some examples. In those, the anthropomorphic figure can act as a guardian or gatekeeper almost as if within a valley guarding an entrance to another world. The Sousa ceramics are perhaps contemporary with painted pottery from Tali Bukan, where anthropomorphic figures also appear, but these have bird-like heads. It may be a representation of a stylized human or perhaps a supernatural being. One perhaps who plays a mediating role between the wild animals of the mountains and the humans and their domesticates. In modern scholarship, he has been termed a shaman, thus linking him with people who are believed to be able to interact with the spirit world through an altered state of consciousness. Equally, he could represent a divine being his representation acting to protect magically the vessel and when carved on seals, the seal owner, as well as their sealed possessions. 
given the variation in the ways in which he is depicted, it is impossible to know if we are looking at one or more uh, variety of beings. Diana Stein has proposed that composite creatures like the shaman, as well as geometric forms and other isolated but recognizable motifs that appear on seals and vessels, may be records of images encountered during stages of trance, induced by meditation, sensory deprivation, or even drugs. These may have become increasingly significant as part of group rituals and social activities that serve to maintain a sense of meaning, identity and cohesion in what appears to have been a period of relatively rapid social, structural social change. Such pressures may have encouraged the notion of composite creatures to be adopted over a wide geographical region. As David Wengro argues, the use of exotic forms not only helped to reinforce rank and status, but as some of these supernatural beings violate basic expectations of the natural world, they are more easily acquired, memorized and transmitted without the need for language. In societies focused on trade routes, such as those along the Zagros Piedmont and within the mountain passes, composite figures within a shared symbolic ideology could play a role in negotiating the risk and uncertainty posed by cultural, social and political differences. And certainly during the fourth millennium BC, the Western Zagros continues to provide visual evidence for the shaman in the form of stamp seals and their impressions. The context and thus the chronology of many of these seals is however unclear and many may date to as late as the early third millennium BC. One example in the Louvre, which you can see on the left of the slide, um, is in the form of a large rectangular stone pendant. It is incised on one surface with a horned shaman and animals, including a stag. On the other face, in the center of the slide, is the scheme, uh, sorry, on the far left of the slide, is the schematic rendering of a temple facade, a motif first known on seals of the late fourth millennium. So again, suggesting a long lived tradition of this uh, imagery. These motifs are comparable with those on another pendant, now in the Ashmolean Museum on the right of the slide. Sadly, however, both pendants are without provenance. That the shaman continued into the late fourth millennia may also be suggested by an extraordinary pair of cast copper alloy sculptures of bearded males wearing a headdress with huge ibex horns, upturned boots and the body of a vulture draped over his shoulders. These statues are also without provenance, which again uh, raises questions of course around their authenticity but they have been dated on the basis that the modeling of their bodies is comparable with sculptures of the late Uruk period recovered from Southern Mesopotamia, particularly the site of Uruk itself. From around 3800 BC, the Khuzestan lowlands of Iran experienced significant cultural influence from Babylonia and Uruk style pottery replaced earlier forms which was perhaps encouraged by a similar economy in both regions. The development of the drill around 3600 BC may account for the development here in Susiana of the stone cylinder seal, the earliest archeologically attested example coming from Susa of level 21 of Acropole one. Impressions made by cylinders now take a baggy style and they show rows of human workers, animals and felines. And these scenes include a master of animals, a standing human figure with raised arms grasping two rearing lions in the tradition of the shaman, especially those known from the stamp seals from Sousa that we just looked at. The master of animals is also known from seal impressions of a later fourth millennium date from Susa and Chogamish, as well as from Uruk, where he's shown grasping a pair of lions or a pair of snakes. 
particularly interesting seal impression from Uruk, from level five in Ayana, associates a number of master of snakes. You can see it in the center of the screen, associated with a bird, possibly a vulture, and a scorpion. Again, a combination of animals that reappears increasingly in these scenes. A combination, of course, that's known earlier on both stamp seals and painted ceramics, but it is now combined with the schematic rendering of a later Rook period temple facade. As Pierre Amier has pointed out, images of humans, possibly nude or belted, who master the forces of nature may derive from the shaman. And a relationship has even been posited between this figure and the so-called priest king who appears during the later Rook period. The only surviving example of a priest king, however, in the guise of a master of animals occurs on the so-called Jebel al Arak knife handle from Egypt. This is a traditional Egyptian uh, manufactured object but the handle carved with imagery, which clearly has relationship with the East. And given that the former trans transmission of this image between Susa, or Babylonia and Egypt, probably in connection with the so-called Uruk expansion of the middle to late Uruk periods, is usually assumed to be through portable cylinder seals or their impressions on imports, there may well have been examples of this motif among them. It is possible, however, that seals or impressions bearing separate images of the master of animals, such as those known from Susa, and the priest king, as known from Uruk, arrived in Egypt separately. And it was here that the themes were conflated. That the master of animals was known in the Nile Valley um, is famously attested on the wall of tomb 100 at Hierakompolis, where, as you see in the bottom right of the slide, a belted hero is depicted holding back two opposing feline creatures, perhaps lions. So while a master of animals may have existed in parallel with a composite shaman, another hybrid creature appears at Susa during the Middle Uruk period, so around 3600 BC. A seal impression, possibly from Acropole 1, level 20, shows the form of a lion with a pair of animals emerging from its back so as to form a pair of wings. You can see it in the top left of the slide, um, indicated as A1. This animal may well be the ancestor of a bird-headed feline with wings, a griffin, that appears relatively frequently in impressions from levels 19 to 18 at Susa. You can see a number of examples um, across the rest of the slide. It's also known um, at the contemporary site of Chogamish. And one stamp seal impression with a griffin is also known from Telcanus on the Euphrates in Syria, suggesting the transmission route um, that takes the griffin from Susa all the way to Egypt. Because this form of griffin appears in Egypt on elite objects, dating to approximately 3300 to 3100 BC and which, like the Jebel el Arak knife, is associated with the expansion of social complexity that ultimately, if not directly, was linked to the emergence of Egypt's earliest kings. An example appears engraved in low relief on this so-called two-dog palette from Hierakompolis, and on a knife handle from Jebel el Tarif, and another example appears on another dagger handle. I couldn't find an image of it, but it comes from a grave at the site of Abydos in uh, Egypt. Other composite creatures are heraldically composed snake-necked felines, or so-called serpopods. These occur at both Susa and in at Uruk. Again, a few examples here. Um, in drawings from seal impressions, a few examples also known at Habubakabira 
and Tel Brak, again, suggesting the route by which they're transported across the Near East, perhaps as seal impressions or portable seals towards Egypt. Because very famous examples, famous representations of serpopods um, appear in Egypt. As you will all um, no doubt recognize, they occur uh, on these carved stone pallets. The two dog pallet in the Ashmolean has a pair of serpopods on the obverse, on the right of the slide, and then a single example appears on the reverse. Heraldic serpopods with entwined necks, so very much more like those on the impressed cylinder seals, appear on the obverse of the Nama palette. And a single serpopod appears on the so-called four dog palette. And finally, we see some heraldic serpopods represented on the so-called Minshatezat palette They're on the right. And then the neck and heads of a heraldic pair are shown on the Spielberg fragment, a little more stylized in form. Like the master of animals, priest king and griffin, it is clear that the serpopods are not part of any native Egyptian artistic tradition. These images on seals and ceilings may have been conveyed to the Nile Valley along several routes, but the presence of griffins might suggest a strong Susian Iranian origin, something that was noted by Beatrice Tessier over 30 years ago. The arrival of this imagery into Egypt is perhaps to be connected with the import of pieces of unworked lapis lazuli that would have been carried across the Iranian plateau from its source in Afghanistan. It is possible that containers holding the stone were sealed, that is branded, with imagery of composite animals to as reflect its foreign destination and perhaps also its otherworldly origins. Both the stone and the images may have been carried, may have carried some of these meanings to Egypt, where they become important in fashioning the institution of divine kingship. By around 3200 BC, stylistic conventions in seal imagery at Susa, probably as argued by Holly Pittman, uh, beginning in level 17 of Acropole 1 begin to be replaced by forerunners of images typical of the succeeding Proto-Elamite period. At approximately the same time, separate styles appeared at Uruk. A bird feline appears in Uruk glyptic, but in a different form to the griffin, known, of course, from Susa. It is depicted, as shown here, as a lion-headed bird in flight that dominates kneeling prisoners and a green jasper seal, sadly without provenance, combines such lion-headed birds with pairs of serpopods. In Iran, the Proto-Elamite culture manifests itself in a range of ceramic forms, distinct imagery on seals and their impressions, and inscribed tablets that have a bookkeeping system related to, yet separate from the Uruk system. The distinctive glyptic draws on ancient highland traditions with an emphasis on animals with elaborate horns and hair. Some seals, such as the one shown at the bottom of the uh, slide, show horned animals flanking a stylized mountain formed from a scale-like mountain motif, from which emerges a conical spade-like tree, reminiscent, of course, of that depicted on the Sousa ceramic we saw earlier. The same form of tree, again associated with stylized mountains, can appear on scenes showing animals acting as humans. Other seals show animals kneeling, pilots in boats, acting as scribes, hunting with weapons or mastering other animals. Among the most magnificent images appears to be that of an upright standing bull holding two lions, and an upright standing lion holding two bulls that was impressed on extremely high level texts. The animals are associated with the hairy triangle, understood as a sign for a ruler. 
as highlighted by Jakob Dale, a fundamental feature of proto-Elamite glyptic in complete contrast with the imagery of contemporary Babylonia is the total absence of humans or human body parts. A number of portable sculptures are judged to belong to the proto-Elamite culture on the basis of comparison with seal impressions on tablets inscribed with proto-Elamite script from Susa. A small grey marble statuette recovered in 1909 from a very poorly documented context at Susa has been reconstructed as a monstrous humped face, humped feline, perhaps a griffin. Other sculptures, however, are without provenance, but finding convinced parallels in proto-Elamite glyptic. So we see the famous crystalline limestone standing lioness and a silver kneeling bull holding a vessel and clothed in a patterned garment. A relation, however, with interregional glyptic is clearly suggested by the seal impression on the reverse of a proto-Elamite tablet, which depicts serpopods. You see in the top right-hand corner of the slide. The tablet is reproduced in an unpublished article by Hassari and Yusefi. My understanding is that it derives from Tepi Sofilin in northern Iraq, but I would value confirmation of that from anyone who will know. The creatures walk to the left with some vitality in contrast to the more static pairs of serpopods with intertwined necks from other cylinder seals and their impressions. Perhaps significantly, the obverse of the tablet includes a hand-drawn hairy triangle then associated with um, a, a senior person, perhaps a ruler. This interregional influence may also be reflected in the carved scenes on the two dog palette from Egypt. Along with a serpopod and a griffin, we've already looked at, a long-tailed dog-like creature wearing a belt or penis sheath and playing an end-blown flute appears. He has been understood in literature to date as a priest wearing a mask, but is perhaps better understood as a proto-Elamite import of an animal acting as a human. Now, while the proto-Elamite bookkeeping system with inscribed tablets is understood to have end ended by 2900 BC at the very latest, there is clearly some continuity in typical proto-Elamite glyptic, if we are to judge from the evidence from the seal impression strata at Ur, levels four to five, which date to the early third millennium BC. A number of impressions have been reconstructed to show an animal banquet. Is this the seal of an official from Susa or elsewhere indeed on the Iranian plateau, managing the delivery of goods or perhaps and managing their acquisition. That people from Babylonia were traveling the other way is suggested now by evidence from the site of Kona Sandal South, excavated by Yusuf Majidide on the uh, site to the south of Tepe Yaya. The sealing evidence as reconstructed by Holly Pittman points to the site being an entrepot or nexus with traders converging from all directions, including from the West, almost certainly via the Persian Gulf. Here in levels dating to the early third millennium, an impression of a city seal of, uh, was discovered of a type that parallels those known from Ur. Roger Matthews and Amy Richardson have argued that the Ur seals um, and their impressions authenticate the receipt of high status food offerings made to important cults by a network of cities in Southern Mesopotamia. The Kona Sandal South image was carried on a door ceiling. Did it secure uh, materials that were destined for Babylonia to feed into this network? Again, opens uh, interesting questions about relationships in both directions. Significantly, the, that city seal was found with the impression of a seal of an, with an image of a standing bull with a distinctly humanoid aspect. 
It is perhaps to be related to the standing bull that was paired with the standing lion on the large Proto-Elamite tablet from Susa we looked at earlier. This Proto-Elamite cultural substrate was an indigenous source for composite creatures that continue to be represented across the Iranian plateau during the Bronze Age. Here, a drawing made from numerous ceilings to ceilings found at Susa, um, reconstructed to produce the so-called jeweler's seal of the mid third millennium BC. The top register has uh, bird-headed and bull-headed humans, now known to be comfortably at home in Iran. Here then is the background to the bull man a standing human with a horned head and bull's legs who appears on Mesopotamian early dynastic one seals. An example of a bull man depicted on a seal from the Shara temple at, from Tel Agrab in the Diyala is understood by Dominique Collin to bridge the gap between Proto-Elamite Iran and contemporary Mesopotamia and must have thereafter influenced Mesopotamian iconography. The bull man in turn can be associated with the recumbent human faced bison, also attested in the seal impression strata levels four to five. Here we can see in the top register a crescent moon and a scorpion. And then further right, full face is a human faced bison. Its body is shown in profile and defined by a series of horizontal lines while its back haunch is represented by a mountain scale pattern. A mirror image of the creature lies to the right. On the back of the human faced bison on the right is perched a lion headed eagle with closed wings, its head held down as if to bite the bison's back. The lion headed eagle is surely related to the composite creature known from Uruk seal impressions in the late Uruk period. This is considered to be the Anzu in Akkadian cuneiform documents, possibly read as Imdugud in Sumerian. And another figure that appears in early dynastic one glyptic is the belted hero who ma masters animals. If, as suggested earlier, he is associated with the mountain shaman, he may have come to supersede him, since the latter disappears by the early third millennium. Two fragmentary stone cups from the Shara temple at Tel Agrab have relief carved imagery in which a central nude belted hero grasps lions, which in turn attack bearded bulls. And they are associated with a scale pattern associating them with mountains. Now much of this highland derived imagery decorates the front of the so-called Great Liar from tomb PG 789 at the Royal Cemetery at Ur, again, mid third millennium in date. In the top register, a nude belted hero grasped two human faced bison. The relationship of the hero and the human faced bison may at this point evoke an invocation of the rule, roles of the so-called Lahmu and Kusarikun as temple guardians and doorkeepers known from texts of the later Akkadian period. A proto-Elamite style animal banquet occupies the central registers, while in the lower register appears a scorpion man, a creature associated with, I quote Donald Hansen, a distant land, distant lands of wild animals and demons, a place passed by the dead. Now that's certainly uh, the perception of the Scorpion Man in Mesopotamia. But the objects in the royal graves were products of an interregional exchange system that had existed for millennia. And this trade moved people and ideas, including religious ideas. This is perhaps made evident in the form of this large plaque of a scorpion man excavated at Kona Sandy South. A creature also known from plaques plundered from uh, the wider region of Giroft. These probably come from graves. They were part of an indigenous belief system, aspects of which were carried west, adopted 
and adapted as examples had for millennia to serve different cultural traditions. Thank you very much indeed.